and I'm a Global Voices Metcalf Administrator here at International House, as well as a board member of the Phoenix Sustainability Initiative, one of our co-sponsors for this event. Hi, my name is Sophia Benzardi. I'm also a Metcalf intern here at International House, and I am a third year environmental and global studies major. Hi, my name is Madeline McCann, and I'm a, also a Global Voices Metcalf intern and uh, a fourth year environmental studies major in the college. The International House Global Voices Lecture Series is delighted to co-sponsor the North American Climate Forum. We would like to thank the following list of co-sponsors for their generosity and hard work in helping to make this event a success. The Government of Canada, the Consulate General of Mexico and Chicago, Argonne National Laboratory, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, the University of Chicago Office of Sustainability, the Program on the Global Environment, the Environmental Law and Policy Center, the Shedd Aquarium, Chicago Booth Energy Group, the Collegiate Scholars Program, Blacks and Green, and three of our green student groups on campus, the Green Economics Group, the Phoenix Sustainability Initiative, and Stop uh, Funding Climate Change U Chicago. We would like to extend a special thank you to the Consulate General of Canada in Chicago. It has been a pleasure collaborating with you on this event. Whether it's a world music or dance performance, lecture, conference, or film festival, the International House Global Voices series presents public programming that advances cross-cultural understanding and opportunities for civil discourse on community, national, and world affairs. I hope all of you will return to the International House throughout the remainder of the year to attend other Global Voices lectures and performances. You can find out more information about these programs on the literature table by the front entrance or you can sign up for our electronic events calendar to receive announcements about upcoming events. Please feel free to post about this event on social media using the hashtag, hashtag NA Climate Forum. Thank you. Now, we are very pleased to introduce you to Steve Brayerton, Consul General of Canada in Chicago. Consul General Brayerton will be introducing the distinguished speakers for our first panel on North America's role in fighting climate change. Please join me in welcoming Consul General Brayerton to International House. Well, well, thank you very much. Uh, I want to uh, say good evening to all of you. Thank you very much for joining us in Grand Bienvenue à tous. Uh, this is a, a tremendous opportunity for us to be here with friends and partners uh, to talk about this important topic of, of climate change and sustainability. I'd like to begin by thanking uh, the International House and, and Director Denise Jorgens and the whole team that have been uh, working so closely with us uh, to make, uh, make this happen tonight. And uh, please join me in uh, thanking uh, the International House for the warm hospitality that we've received here. Uh, it's also especially a great, uh, a great treat for, for me, a great pleasure to be working in partnership uh, with the Consulate General of Mexico. Uh, representatives from the Consulate General are here this evening and uh, we have uh, a, great, uh, a great partnership that uh, extends uh, across uh, a wide, very wide array of, of activities, but certainly in the environmental uh, sphere. Um, we, uh, we know that, that climate change has no respect for national or, or state boundaries. Uh, our countries, the three countries, have had a long history of partnership and collaboration and a shared interest in working together to preserve our, our shared environment. This, this goes back um, uh, quite, uh, quite a long way. Uh, most recently at the North American Leaders Summit held in Ottawa this past June, President Obama, President uh, Peña uh, Nieto, and Prime Minister Trudeau announced an, an, the launch of an ambitious North American Climate, Clean Energy, and Environment Partnership. And our first panel will be discussing the, the key elements of this partnership and other national and international initiatives uh, to address these issues. So I'd like to take the opportunity to briefly introduce them. Uh, our moderator for the first session uh, is Howard Lerner. He will serve, uh, serve as our moderator. Howard is the President and Executive Director at the Environment Law and Policy Center. The Environmental Law and Policy Center is the Midwest's leading public interest environmental legal advocacy and eco-business innovation organization. 
and certainly among uh, the nation's leaders. Uh, we have three representatives. I'll uh, uh, begin from uh, the left that be seated. Uh, Daniel Wolfish uh, joins us from Ottawa uh, today. Uh, Dan is the Director General for Environment and Climate Change in, uh, in the department that is now known as Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, the mandate uh, for the department which Dan works includes protecting the environment, conserving Canada's natural heritage, and providing weather and meteorological information to keep Canadians like me informed and safe. Welcome, Dan. Uh, from, from Mexico, uh, also arrived uh, here in Chicago today, uh, we're delighted to have Enrique Lendo uh, Fuentes. Uh, Enrique is head of the International Affairs at the Mexican Secretary of the Environment and Natural Resources. The Secretariat is charged with the mission of protecting, restoring, and conserving the ecosystems, natural resources, assets, and environmental services of Mexico with the goal of fostering sustainable development. And joining us from Washington, uh, and I recognize that painting on the back wall, so I believe it's the Canadian Embassy in Washington. We're very pleased to have uh, Christine uh, Dragosek here uh, with us uh, remotely, but Christine, we're delighted that you are here. Uh, Christine serves as the Deputy Associate Director for Energy and Climate Change at the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Now, within the White House, the Council uh, of Environmental Quality coordinates U.S. federal environmental efforts and works closely with agencies and other White House offices to develop environmental policies and initiatives in the United States. So, many thanks. Uh, for joining us. Many thanks to my friends and colleagues at the Embassy in Washington for supporting uh, the initiative here today. So at this point, Howard, I'd like to turn it over to you. Please join me in welcoming our panel. And thank you to the Council General for the introductions. I'll be very short. You have a panel here of three top specialists on policy issues, environmental issues, from Canada, Mexico, and the United States to talk about the collaborative efforts that the three countries are coming together to do to move forward with climate change solutions and particularly clean energy. Uh, each of the panelists will talk for about five minutes and tell you from the perspective of first Mexico, then Canada, and the United States of how the countries are moving forward individually and together I may queue up a couple of questions, but we want to make sure we leave a lot of time. If you have questions, get ready. There's a microphone for you. And we're going to try to have more of a conversation uh, than having a lot of static presentations. So this should be an interesting panel, and let's begin. Enrique, fall to you. Thank you. Thank you so very much to everyone, in particular the Council Aid of Canada Council. Thank you. Thank you very much. I recognize also the, the presence of my colleagues from the Mexican Council Aid. Thank you, Bernardo, and uh, the other colleagues. Of course, uh, our appreciation to the University of Chicago. I, was, I had the privilege to be here two years ago and in a, in a similar discussion, and it went very, very well. I was very happy to be here with my with my former boss. Uh, uh, well, if we go to the first uh, slide, please. The second slide. Okay. There you go. There you go. Well, I guess the, the first point is that uh, there are still uh, many things around the world, and that is very worrying, who still do not believe that climate change is a reality. This is something we've been fighting. People who believe in climate change have been fighting for the last three decades, a little, a little more over, you know, three decades. And uh, three decades ago, the United Nations convened a group of scientists called the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They started doing the work, their work in the mid 80s. And after five reports, and we're talking about 
over 500 scientists from all around the world, representing most of the countries of the world, some of them with Nobel Prizes, have been advancing the research. And in the, in the latest, uh, uh, in, the, in the latest report, they, they present two uh, conclusions. This was uh, a couple of years ago. The first conclusion is the temperature of the world is indeed increasing. It has almost increased by one, one degree in 100 years. And if you compare that with the previous historic time, this is, this is worrying and it's, it's a lot. And the second conclusion is that it has been induced by human action. It's an anthropogenic influence. So the human race is actually placing an impact. And this, this is not something I'm telling you. This is not something that an NGO, an activist is telling you. This is something that over 500 scientists from most of the countries on the world have found over 40 years. And that is the reason why in the framework of the UN, in the framework of the North American uh, institutional arrangements for cooperation that we have, we have decided to take action in a collaborative way. We go to the second slide. Why is Mexico so involved in this? We started getting involved also about three decades ago, and mainly for two reasons. The first reason is that Mexico is a vulnerable country. We don't emit a lot compared to other, other countries. We're a moderate emitter. We, we emit about 1.4% of the global, global emissions, but the impacts of, of, of climate change impact Me Mexico severely. We were a very vulnerable country. In the, just in the last decade, we have been hit by 30 major storms and hurricanes. Last year, for instance, we were hit by the strongest hurricane ever reported, ever registered in the history, in the history of the world, which was Hurricane Patricia. The scale of hurricanes go from one to five. The, the, the wind spin in, in the, in the, when they were uh, measuring Patricia went over 150 miles an hour. I mean, that means that it went beyond the scale that was perceived that was, that was calculated for previous hurricane, but if there was a higher scale than that, they would have given that to, to Patricia. We didn't have major impacts in terms of human lives. We had some impacts in terms of uh, infrastructure, but I mean, the thing is that we're a vulnerable country, we're impacted uh, by, by uh, hydrometeorological events from both sides of the, of the oceans, from the Atlantic and the Pacific. Uh, and that is the reason why, if we are to demand to the international community, because the only way to tackle climate change is by cooperative action, by, by every country taking its share, we need to take action ourselves. So Mexico has been building capacities, analyzing the issue, uh, and also establishing a framework of regulations and, uh, and instruments to tackle the issue of climate change. We go to the next one. We're not alone in this in this uh, in this uh, challenge. Canada and the U.S. face uh, similar similar challenges. If we are to to measure the impacts of climate change in uh, in terms of statistics, and this is very tough because we haven't you know worldwide we have not agreed on methods to measure the impacts of climate change in monetary terms. It's, we have a few, a few approaches, but they, they're not conclusive, and each, pretty much each country gets its own, its own data. But in the case of Mexico, for instance, 50% of the national territory is vulnerable to climate change. 68.2% of the population and 71% of GDP is vulnerable to climate change. That means that the potential risk of climate change goes over to 60 billion dollars. So that's a, that's a high figure. And, uh, but if you look at Canada and, and, and the US, they have similar, similar threats from, from climate change. We address the issue differently, but we, we all share that the impacts of climate change, climate change affect us. In the case of the US, for instance, that they, they have very, 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 very good data. And uh, 
and uh, about about uh, forty six percent of the total total potential risk for climate change is is uh, registered in the in the U.S. If you if the risk of potential risk of climate change goes to trillion dollars, you just make the math and, and try to measure how much that is. And Canada ca Canada also has some uh, some numbers on this, but the main issues in terms of vulnerability are uh, wildfires, droughts, and, and floods. We go to the next one. So Mexico is been undertaking different different initiatives for a long time, the last three decades. In this slide, I, I only show the, the, the work we've been doing in this administration, but we're starting uh, developing climate change strategies and different instruments for for about for about thirty years. Uh, the, I guess the, what the, the, the main uh, the main issue uh, starting this administration was uh, that we enacted the general law of climate change. We were the second country in the world to enact a climate change law. The only developing country who, who, undertook, who undertook an, an initiative uh, like this. And you know, from that law, we developed a set of planning and policy instruments, including a climate change uh, strategy. We set up an uh, interministerial commission of climate change consisting of 14 ministries among Mexico that have something to do for climate change in terms of policy, in terms of, of measuring, in terms of, of governance. We also develop a, a climate change program for this administration, which includes over 150 measures. We undertook also uh, uh, an energy reform that has also been helping a lot to the transition from fossil fuels to, to clean energy. We're establishing different uh, economic instruments, like uh, we established two years ago, a carbon tax. We started a clean energy market within the, within the, the energy transition reform, and we, uh, we will start a carbon market in, 20, in 2018. At the international level, of course, we have subscribed most of the climate change agreements. The last one, the, the of course, the, the North American Leaders Summit that was that was talked about, but before that, the Paris Agreement were among the first country with the Canada and the U.S. signing and ratifying the the Paris the Paris Agreement. So we, we see this as a, as an issue to be worked out with the international community together, and in the in the case of a region with, with the U.S. and Canada. If we go to the next one. What are the virtues, uh, according to us, of the uh, of the Paris? Paris Agreement. I guess the, the most important thing about the Paris Agreement is that it is, you know, compared to previous agreement, and that's that agreements, and that's the reason I think it's the best agreement that has has ever put in place, is that it has an universal and legal binding status. That means that every country, every single country except for one, subscribe the Paris Agreement, and not only that, every single country within the United Nations Framework Convention, or most of them, put a proposal of mitigation that called uh, INDCs, Intended National Determined Contributions. You know, establishing very clearly how much they will reduce their emissions, the way they are gonna adapt, the way they will finance in the, in the period of 2020-2030. So, is that important or not? Well, it is important compared to other agreements that are not legally binding and compared to the previous agreements within the United Nations in which, for instance, the Kyoto Protocol, the Kyoto Protocol you only had about 40 countries subscribing, subscribing binding commitments. It also has some other virtues. It's dynamic. Uh, it is based on the science. I mean, they, they actually took the, uh, the advice from the scientific community of setting the, the, the goal of, uh, of a stabilizing temperature below two Celsius at the, at the end of the century. And it has many other virtues. It has a balance between adaptation issues and mitigation issues. It has, it has a good proposal on financing and carbon markets. So if you analyze the Paris Agreement, this is it's not enough. It, don't, it does not take us at this point to the, to the goal that, we, that, that we're hoping we, we should get. But, you know, with this, with this uh, 
issue of uh, being being progressive, of having leaving room to, to for improvement, it will take us at some point if we if we play by the book. If we go to the next one, please. Uh, that's the, the goal that Mexico set within the, the, the Paris Agreement. Even though we're an oil country, and a lot of our revenues come from, from oil extraction, most of the revenue from the government, for instance, we are uh, compromising to reduce our emissions unconditionally 22% by 2030. And 51% of black carbon were among the, the, the only countries that established a, a, a target on black carbon. And if we see that all the issues are advanced, like the price of carbon, like financing and technology development, we're willing to increase that to 36% of CO2 and 70% of black carbon. That's an else. I, I won't get a lot into that because I leave that to, to them because they were the host of the NALT agreement. But this is probably one of the most ambitious agreements. Uh, this, this is a political agreement. It's a, it's a political agreement among heads of the states. You're like leading, leading the process. But we're talking about 50% of a commitment of 50% uh, goal on clean energy by 2025. 40 to 44 percent of methane emission reductions by 2025, uh, facing down subsidies and many other issues. We have like 50 targets within the NALT agreement, and uh, uh, Dan will elaborate on that. There are some other agreements that uh, Canada, can we go to the next one? And Mexico, Mexico Canada, and the US have been also supporting one day in which Canada and Mexico joins is uh, the carbon pricing. To me, the only way to do this efficiently is by setting the price of carbon. Nowadays, most of economic agents emit CO2 and other gases to the atmosphere without paying the cost for it. So the only way to have those economic agents to reduce their emissions, besides regulation, will be by setting the price of carbon, by setting the incentives for technology transformation by setting centers for uh, business business development and economic transformation in the framework of green growth. Next one, please. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll just tell you, give you a little, little two things on, on how Mexico is going to do this, how Mexico is going to implement the agreements. We're setting, setting a goal within, within our energy uh, reform uh, strategy of of uh, reaching 25% of clean energy by 2018, 35% by 2024, and 43% by 2030. And the other, the other issue we're doing, uh, the next one, and I, this I talk a little bit about, is the, the economic instruments. We have set a carbon tax. We, we had a revenue of $1 billion of that, and this is putting an incentive for, for technology transformation towards renewable energy. Uh, eliminating or facing 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 down uh, subsidies to fossil fuels, uh, uh, establishing a clean energy market, and in 2018 we will establish a carbon market. I think that's that's pretty much it. And I'm I'm, I'm open for for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bonjour. Je vais faire la, la plupart de mes commentaires en anglais, mais si vous avez des questions en français, vous en prie de, de les poser. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me here today. Um, a huge thank you to the Canadian consulate, the Mexican consulate, the University of Chicago for arranging today's conversation. I think today's conversation is really important, and I think um, bringing the three countries together to have this discussion is quite a testament to the hard work that we have done um, over the last uh, several months to make a difference in the world. If you think about October alone, it's an historic month for climate change and, and combating climate change internationally. In this month, we've got Paris ratification. So that means that when we meet in Marrakesh in November, it'll be the first members uh, meeting of the party under the, 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 the Paris framework. And that's a huge accomplishment. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the work that collectively Mexico, Canada, and the United States did in encouraging countries to adopt 
um, and have early ratification, the early coming into force of the agreement. That's one example of how our cooperation internationally has had an impact. Two, in Kigali, just a few weeks ago, we came to an agreement to amend the Montreal Protocol for the phase down of HFCs. The bulk of that work was based upon the North American proposal, Canada, US, and Mexico, going out there, collaborating, talking, conjoling, convincing, using our science to convince countries to sign on to an agreement to phase down. Probably the Montreal Protocol, along with Paris, will do more um, to help combat global warming than anything else. But in addition, in, in, the, in October, we've seen an agreement through the International Civil Aviation Organization on uh, an agreement for uh, global uh, market-based measures to help combat climate change and reduce emissions through the international transboundary civil aviation industry. Again, another major initiative moving forward. Another one that was identified specifically in our North American Leader Summit, G7 uh, communiques, G20 communiques, around how we want to make sure we uh, combat climate change. So this is an example of how when the three countries come together and work together, we can achieve important outcomes internationally. Um, I do want to particularly note and, and thank uh, Enrique for the work that he has done in the last few months in bringing us together. I think uh, in, in, in uh, September, September 9th, the ministers met in, um, in Merida, had a great meeting, um, produced a ministerial statement um, from our, our three countries. A lot of it around the environment, around climate change, and about implementing the North American Leader Statement, and really coming together to demonstrate global leadership on the environment uh, more generally, but on climate change specifically. Um, but on top of that, uh, Mexico, I guess uh, coming up in a few weeks, will be hosting COP13. Uh, 35 days to go, then counting for COP13. So again, another uh, demonstration of leadership uh, by Mexico um, on the environmental front globally. Um, Canada will be stepping up to uh, the plate uh, next year, and I'll get into that in a little bit more in my comments. But I'll move now um, uh, quickly on to slide, uh, slide two. Um, so I just identified a couple of purposes of my presentation. I want to uh, provide a bit of an overview of what Canada is doing and then showcase a, uh, a little bit more about North America. I'll uh, move on to slide three. Um, I thought Enrique's presentation was great. He kind of set up the global <laughs> challenge and then talked about what, how uh, Mexico is responding to that global challenge and how we are working in tandem and how we experience the impacts of climate change together. I won't go into a lot of detail about how Canada is experiencing uh, the impacts of climate change. Like Mexico, we've got our vulnerable communities. In particular, for us, we're very concerned about the north. The north is a bit of a, a canary in a coal mine. We experience the global warming in extremes in the north, and you'll may recall the news of uh, the past spring around the wildfires that we had in north of Alberta in the area around the oil sands um, that were um, uh, unprecedented type of forest fires in Canada. Again, an indication of, of, of climate change. So action is needed, and uh, for Canada, the, uh, the basis of our policy moving forward is found in the Paris Agreement. That's to say that we want to limit global warming no more than 2%, and if we can try and keep it to 1.5% or lower, even better. So that's the framework, that's the basis by which we're working on it. Um, and what's important to acknowledge here is that some of the decisions that have to be made are hard ones, they're tough ones, they're ones that come with um, some question and thinking around investments, uh, reallocating resources nationally, thinking through um, uh, different ways to use your tax system. So they're tough, they're hard decisions, they affect people in their pocketbooks. Um, and they're tough decisions that have the payback only comes maybe 5, 10, 20, 30 years later. They don't come in an election cycle. And so sometimes it takes real leadership to take this action on climate change. And I think it's particularly appreciated to talk about this uh, during the time of the American election, where people are feeling vulnerable, where the people are feeling that uh, sometimes things have gotten out um, beyond them and they're losing a sense of uh, control over their lives. And so when we think about climate change and policies around climate change, we need to understand that those come hand in hand with our economic decision making and how we protect the vulnerable, the, the people who are the most uh, implicated by the change and support them through those changes. And so I think that's an important context of the work that we're doing um, under the Paris Agreement uh, in our three countries, uh, but in Canada in particular. And I would like to note that uh, as we move forward in Canada with implementing Paris, we've identified our nationally determined contribution to be um, by 2030, a reduction of 30% uh, of emissions below the 2005 levels, and that it will be an economy-wide um, reduction. So that's kind of the, the framework under which we're working in Canada. 
On slide three, four, um, I want to identify a couple of areas where we've got some international priorities that are coming out of the Paris Agreement. And my minister, in particular, Minister McKenna, has been very active globally um, talking about these issues and building global support for them. And I think uh, very important for us moving forward as we head into Marrakesh and beyond, Marrakesh COP22, um, at the end of, um, coming mid next month, November, um, is that we put in place a really strong framework for transparency and accounting. That countries can come forward, identify what their national contributions are, and then their progress that they're making on that five-year cycle for achieving that. That's the accountability that we have and that we need to make. The best way to do this is also, and the best way to achieve our targets and our goals is through market-based measures, whether they be uh, carbon tax, trading, what have you. And so um, making sure that we can make full use of those market-based measures under the Paris Agreement is something that Canada is particularly interested in, working with Mexico and working with others, China, the EU, on how we move those forward. A key part of the work that we have to do is the development of these mid-century low-carbon economic growth strategies. And I want to pause on this for a moment. This is key stuff. This is really the plan that we need to implement that will talk about how we make that transition from a, a carbon economy to uh, something else. And to do so, where we're thinking about what are the pathways for creating new technologies, the adoption of new technologies, it's the entrepreneurship, it's the innovation, it's the investment, it's leveraging the private sector involvement in the work and making sure there are clean jobs available and transitions available for people so that they're not getting left behind in the economy. And that's an incredibly important part of our climate change actions. It's not enough just to regulate. It's also about making sure that as we transition our economies, we're doing so that creates uh, incentives for the private sector to invest, incentives for entrepreneurs to get out there and create new jobs, and incentives for people to develop the skills to participate in the new economy. And so these uh, mid-century low carbon economic growth strategies are gonna be um, fundamental pieces for us in Canada, how we learn from each other, Canada, United States, and Mexico, and then what we learn from our, our, our colleagues internationally. Then another big plank for Canada is working through our climate diplomacy and making sure that we are continuously working with the developing world, our colleagues in Europe, Africa, and Asia, to make sure that we are implementing uh, Paris and keeping our, our and learning from each other and making best use of the knowledge and the technologies available globally. This notion of um, climate diplomacy is becoming a key plank of Canada in the work that we want to do as we move forward, not just to making sure that we have success out of Paris, but also because a part of what Canada is doing is it's um, taking its steps forward on trying to uh, win a bid on the UN Security Council in, in 2020. So it's really forming a central plank for the work that we do in Canada. I'm going to move on to slide five and break down what we mean by climate diplomacy. Um, first and foremost, I want to identify that climate diplomacy goes beyond just talking to country to country. It's about making sure that everybody is participating in the process. And my minister herself identified three areas where she wants to focus on uh, some of her attention. One, the involvement of women in decision making and understanding the impacts of climate change on women in vulnerable communities. And so for that reason, she's been an active member of the Troika Plus. Uh, an organization set up by the Mary Robinson Foundation that really looks at uh, gender impacts of climate change and ensures that women are involved in the decision making about climate change at all levels, whether it be local or international, right all the way up. So it's a key piece. Two, indigenous. Uh, making sure that there's indigenous involvement in the conversation, that we're recognizing indigenous rights and the participation in decision making, looking at um, impacts, climate resilience, and issues like that. And in fact, that piece around Indigenous is an area where both Canada, Mexico, and the United States have come together. Uh, it's a big part of the work that we do under the uh, Commission for Environmental Cooperation. We have a roster of um, traditional knowledge where we work and, and, and engage and learn from best practices. In an area where we continue to work in the North American Leaders Statement made a very strong commitment to making sure that we find better ways to engage uh, traditional knowledge in the work that we do on climate change. But in addition to that, Canada is also trying to put a little bit of money uh, behind its actions. And we've committed uh, $2.65 billion to su support the transition to a low carbon economies uh, internationally. And part of that is making sure that we can invest in those organizations that will help leverage or unlock the risk taking in the private sector and unlock the investment from the private sector. And these are, this is an important piece here because governments can't do it alone. It requires uh, a reallocation of the resources globally 
um, to make sure that we are investing in the technologies and the adoption of these technologies to bring to ourselves to a low carbon economy. And then part of this is also working internationally on carbon pricing initiatives. Enrique had talked a lot about that earlier, and I'll get into a little bit uh, in a couple of slides from now about what Canada is doing specifically on carbon pricing. But making sure there's a putting a price on carbon and making sure that polluters pay is an important part of our steps forward, uh, both domestically and internationally. So what are we doing at home? On slide uh, six, I've identified a couple of steps. What's really important is that um, Canada, we're going to work lockstep, uh, hand in glove, with our provinces and territories and with the Indigenous leadership in our country. And we've put in place a process to make sure that we're engaging and consulting with all of them. We uh, issued in March the Vancouver Declaration, which is founded on the Paris Agreement, but talks about how we're going to implement this NDC, uh, NDC within Canada. And in doing so, we also made sure we had a very robust consultation with Canadians, a wide open process through Twitter, through the Facebook portal, through internet portals, to ensure that we had as much as as many ideas as we can. Our minister was tweeting about it regularly and daily. And in fact, one of the best submissions we ever got was through the University of British Columbia video submission, where they talked how the youth were, were talking about, and the students at the UBC were talking about the importance of taking action today on climate change and the ideas that they had. Um, so an important part of our work, through the Vancouver uh, Declaration, we set up four working groups to help us develop our pan-Canadian framework for climate change. One around mitigation efforts, what are the regulatory and non-regulatory measures that we need to take to reduce emissions. Two, innovation, what are the uh, steps we need to do to get the private sector engaged, increase entrepreneurship, and come up with new ideas, market-based ideas that can come and help uh, combat um, uh, climate change. Three, a working group on carbon pricing, so that we can put in place a national approach to having carbon pricing across Canada that makes a level playing field for all companies operating across Canada. And uh, lastly, uh, a working group on adaptation and resilience. On slide seven, I'll talk a little bit about the outcomes of uh, the pan-Canadian framework. So the first point to note is that we haven't finished it yet. Uh, it should be going towards our first minister's meeting on December 9th. So our first minister's meetings, all the premiers of all the provinces, um, the national leadership of our three indigenous organizations, and our prime minister are gonna meet and confirm what the framework will look like. But we have hints of already where we're going. And I think the big pieces that our Prime Minister announced in Parliament and our Minister announced to her colleagues um, in a meeting in um, early October that we're going to have a carbon price in Canada. There will be a carbon price set of $10 per ton, and that'll come into force in 2018. It will rise up to $50 per ton by 2022. A couple of interesting facts about this, um, or approach, interesting. Um, Things to think about when you about our carbon price in Canada. It's not going to be a national tax. What we're saying is there's going to be a national standard. But the revenues are going to be revenue neutral for the federal government. The revenues will go to the provinces and territories to use how they feel necessary. The provinces will get to choose how they want to meet that standard. They can use cap and trade, like Ontario and Quebec are doing, through cooperation with California and Mexico. Or they can do a tax like British Columbia and Alberta are doing. So they can choose the approach as long as they choose, have that minimum standard. And the reason why we want the minimum, minimum standard is so that there's no uneven playing field in Canada, uh, that every province is setting a similar approach for business, and so that um, there's no place where you can go to get a, a better deal or a race to the bottom in terms of a, 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 a burden on business. But what's also important about it is that it will shift the tax burden from Canadians. So the idea is many provinces are looking at, and what British Columbia did when they put in place their tax, and uh, Alberta did the same, is they shifted from income tax to carbon tax. So the impact on the individual was not necessarily any different, but it was a progressive approach to achieve policy outcomes that was important. So that was an interesting uh, approach that Canada is taking as we move forward on our carbon tax in Canada. On slide eight, I want to talk a little bit about North America and our collaboration. I started off talking about some of the things we achieved nationally. I want to note that we're at a very important time in Canada-US-Mexico relations. We're at a time where not only is the vision 
and the agreement the same around what we need to do about climate change, but our values are the same too. The values around making sure that gender uh, is a part of our analysis and part of our decision making, that indigenous are part of the analysis and part of our decision making, that youth are involved as well. An example of some of this is that um, the recent meeting in Merida, Mexico appointed a youth uh, as a member of the, uh, the JPAC, the uh, Joint uh, Public Advisory Council, as a permanent member of uh, the JPAC. So what did Canada do? We copied them. We said, yeah, we're going to do the same thing. So we launched a public process. We asked youth to say, who wants to be part of the process? And we got applications. And now we, Canada will be in a position to be able to identify a youth and participate in that process too. I think that's fantastic. Our Prime Minister wanted to set up a youth council, set out a public process to say, who's interested, please apply. He wanted to have 60 people to kind of be a Prime Minister's youth council. He got 10,000 applicants. Wow. 10,000 applicants. 50% of those applicants identify the environment and climate change as an interest of theirs. 50%. That means the future of a politician who wants success today, you better talk climate change. You better talk about a trust transition, about good jobs, about skills, but you better talk about that in the context of climate change. So that's kind of the work that's happening. But um, our, our, bilateral, our trilateral relationship uh, in North America goes a long way, and I want to pause a little bit about uh, NAFTA. NAFTA's gotten a lot of uh, talk lately and uh, a lot of questions. What's important about NAFTA is it's a progressive trade agreement. As part of NAFTA, we negotiate the three countries a side agreement specifically to deal with the environment. And we do. We've got a long history since 1992 about talking about the environment. And I encourage everybody to take a look at the last ministerial statement that came out of Merida, where the ministers talked about making sure they put in place the social infrastructure, the crowdsource ideas on the environment. Where they talked about how decisions on the environment and the economy go hand in hand. How we need to have youth involvement and indigenous involvement in the decision making on the economy and the environment. So these are things that go hand in hand, and I think it was very important. But in addition to that, the relationship between Canada and Mexico and the United States are also supported by not just the environment ministers, but the energy ministers. An MOU was recently signed um, in Winnipeg in, uh, in the spring that formed the basis of the trilateral cooperation between the three ministers. They've got a very ambitious work plan, much of that now um, codified in the North American Leader Statement. And with that, I'll turn to the North American Leader Statement and talk a little about that for a moment. Slide uh, nine. So this is an, an important agreement. Um, it's important because it sets targets. 50% reduction in each country in methane emissions by 2025. 50% generation in clean energy by 2025. 100% procurement in the United States and Canada by the government of clean energy. Um, the adoption of, and it, it, the um, dissemination of clean vehicles in all three countries. Uh, clean government operations, setting a social, uh, or aligning our approach for the social cost of carbon. These are important steps. We have a work, uh, an agreement that the leader signed off on that is very substantive, a work plan that's even more substantive, and targets that we can go back and measure our success against. And these are important initiatives. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit for a second about the social cost of carbon, because that's one that came up a lot in our conversations when we were working with the White House. We were working with Mexico, and it's an interesting part because we're here at the University of Chicago where we know economics is an important part of the work that we do. And so um, the social cost of carbon helps us do our cost benefits better. You want to put a regulation through and you understand what the cost of carbon are, and so you can make a justification for a regulation to take action because you know you're reducing carbon and what that cost of that carbon reduction will be. We can now start thinking about that in Canada and the United States, and we're aligning our approach, and so we have a common language. So that's very important stuff that we've got in the North American Leaders Summit. We've got five areas that we're working on, securing clean power, driving down short-lived climate pollutants, things like methane, black carbon, and uh, HFCs, promoting clean and uh, efficient transportation, uh, protecting nature and advancing science, and showing global leadership on climate change. So moving forward, I'm on slide uh, 10. There's a lot of work to be done. We've got to continue to think through the implementation. We need to go back and check on how we're progressing against the commitments we made in NALS. And of course in Canada, and I suspect in Mexico, we're starting to prepare for how we work with the incoming administration in the United States, the White House, the Congress, the Senate. 
um, and making sure that we continue that engagement and that collaboration using the North American Leaders Statement uh, and, the, and in Canada's perspective, the joint statement that we had with the March 10th visit as the basis of our conversation as we engage further on the, on, on the economy, on the environment, and on trade. Canada is taking huge steps forward to putting forward uh, a progressive trade agenda. Our minister was recently in Europe talking about the and uh, the value of a progressive trade agenda where we care about the environment, we care about labor, we care about skills, and unleashing the entrepreneurialism and the investment so that we can create jobs in all of these areas as we transition the economy. It's got to be a fair and just transition, but we need to make that transition. 2017 is shifting up to be quite a year for Canada. We're going to be hosting uh, the CEC in Charlottetown at the end of June. Um, it's an opportunity for the minister, the secretary from uh, Mexico to join our minister and your new administrator to come and join us and have a conversation on, on climate change and other environmental uh, issues. We're going to be hosting World Environment Day in the first half of June. Canada will assume uh, later after uh, the, 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 um, the meetings in, in Italy, the, the, the chair of the G7, and then we'll be hosting the, uh, the meeting of the parties in the Montreal Protocol. So taking um, a bit of a, a page out of Mexico's book on the leadership it showed this year, Canada's stepping up to the plate next year. And so I hope that uh, I'll be able to see many of my colleagues back in Canada a number of times as we continue these conversations. Um, and then on slide 11, I'll leave you with a, a few closing thoughts. But one, now is the time, the time is right for Canada, Mexico, and the United States to continue our collaboration. We're aligned on our values, we're aligned on our mission, our vision. Now we just gotta get aligned on our actions and I think we're getting uh, step by step there and I'm, I'm quite optimistic about the way forward. We need to do so in an inclusive and open way that involves the most vulnerable, it unleashes the best of our, uh, our in innovative and creative minds can bring and uh, together I am uh, confident that we'll be able to have a transition to an economy that's dynamic while bringing down global emissions for climate change. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Good evening, everybody. Um, I want to start by thanking the Government of Canada and the University of Chicago. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to join the Government of Mexico in this event. As a native Chicagoan, I would have very much liked to have been there in person. I would very much like to be there in person to see the Cubs play as well, <laughs> but it wasn't to be. So thanks for letting me join virtually. I'll try and keep my remarks brief. Um, I think Enrique and Daniel covered a lot of what I would have said, but maybe I'll start out by reflecting on climate change from a domestic perspective. This has been, as I'm sure you're aware, one of the signature issues for President Obama and his administration from the very beginning. We have a climate action plan, which sets out the vision for American leadership in this space, both at home and abroad. It outlines a series of measures that we've put great effort into implementing over the last few years in all our sectors across the economy and working with partners overseas. And thanks to that, we've moved forward, I think, in a domestic space in a way that's been uh, both robust and unexpected, both in terms of substance and in terms of collaboration. And we've been very fortunate to be able to work with partners like Canada and Mexico to achieve what uh, was perhaps unimaginable even a few years ago in the international space. At home, we've done a lot in the last few years. We've set fuel economy standards for cars and trucks and heavy duty vehicles that will transform the emissions profile of our fleet for decades to come. We finalized regulations to limit methane from oil and gas and from land and fills. And methane is one of the most potent greenhouse, gas and, uh, greenhouse gases that there are. We've established the first ever national standards on carbon pollution from power plants. We've worked to set 35 new or updated energy efficiency standards for buildings and for appliances. That sounds small, but the energy savings associated with these standards are immense of cumulatively. We've made historic investments in clean energy technologies. We've worked with our farmers, our ranchers, our producers, and our landowners to promote climate-smart agriculture and forestry. 
And at an international level, we've been really pleased to join Canada, Mexico, and other major emitters like China to promote global actions to address climate change. So for us, this commitment to action was codified in our Copenhagen pledge to reduce our emissions in the range of 17% below our 2005 levels by 2020. And more recently in our nationally determined contribution, uh, once we officially uh, joined the Paris Agreement, our intended nationally determined contribution or target became a full on nationally determined contribution. And that is to reduce our emissions in the range of 26 to 28% below 2005 levels by 2025. And I'll just note that that actually for us means a doubling of the pace of emissions reductions between 2020 and 2025, which is a pretty strong trend in action here. I should note though that the federal government isn't alone in taking action. We have the support of an incredible community of people, of institutions taking action at home in any number of ways at any number of scales. You look, for example, at California, which recently passed the SB 32 bill, which will require them to reduce emissions to 40% below 1990 levels by 2030. You look at cities like Chicago or uh, Portland or Baltimore, which have put in place plans to cut emissions and to reduce the resilience of their cities and their communities. We have 154 American businesses act on climate partners. These are companies who have taken specific commitments to cut the emissions through their companies, through their actions, and through their supply chains. A number of companies like Solar City or General Electric or NextEra that are developing and deploying renewable energy technologies all across the US at every scale from household solar to industrial scale deployments. And the shift in the supply of renewable energy has been remarkable in the last few years. Our tribes are addressing mitigation and adaptation through a number of initiatives, including the Tribal Climate Change Project. And our civil society and academic institutions, the University of Chicago is one of the best examples, continue to forge new ground in research, in implementation, and in activism, which is key to keeping us all accountable. Because of the work of these actors and of the federal government, we've seen remarkable results in the last couple of years in the fight against climate. Renewable energy capacity in the United States from non-hydro resources has tripled between 2008 and 2015. We now generate more than three times as much electricity from wind and 30 times as much electricity from solar as we did in 2008. Our energy intensity of our economy fell from 2008 to 2015 by 11%. The carbon intensity declined by 18%. All this time, the economy was growing. So we started to make real progress on decoupling emissions and energy use from economic growth. Through the first six months of 2016, our energy-related CO2 emissions were at their lowest level in 25 years, even while the economy doubled in this time. So we're on track to meet our climate targets, and we're on track to do that while growing the economy, which I think is uh, Daniel spoke a little bit earlier about how our economic messages and our climate messages must go hand in hand. But one of the things that I think we know is that it's not sufficient for any one of us to act alone. This is a global issue. It requires action by each of us, and it requires action by every country. So we've made real efforts to encourage those around the world to work on mitigating climate change and to adapt to the unavoidable impacts you saw this in 2014 when President Obama and President Xi announced the historic new emissions reductions targets, making the first commitment ever by China to peak at its emissions. And China, as you may know, is the world's largest emitter. The US is the world's second largest emitter. So the commitments by these two countries were substantively important and were politically very important, I think, to moving uh, the global community into a place where everyone was willing to make commitments. In December, nearly 200 countries came together to reach the historic Paris Agreements. You've heard a lot about this, but it was the cooperation with Canada, with Mexico, and with a number of other countries in the months and years ahead of the Paris Agreement that made this possible. And it will be the uh, commitment by each of us to cooperate on implementation that will make the achievement of those targets possible. 
As uh, Enrique and Daniel mentioned, you've seen two other historic agreements just in the last month. The International Civil Aviation Organization's agreement to cap its emissions and offset the remaining emissions. The Montreal Protocols Amendment that sets out a timeline for globally phasing out hydrofluorocarbons. And the resources of the United States government will continue to be behind supporting partners around the world in implementing their own national targets and implementing these global targets that we've set, building the resilience of communities around the world to climate change over time. With all the partnerships that we have, I think it's fair to say that our uh, commitment to collaboration with Mexico and with Canada is absolutely unique. We share a continent, but our economies and our energy systems and our ecosystems are integrated in ways that I think few people truly understand. Because of this, we know that it's key to work together to develop a common approach to addressing climate change across the continent. This is why the North American Leader Summit agreement that you've heard about uh, this summer was so important. It's why our interagency teams in each of the countries has put a lot of effort into implementing each of the targets. We've got a number of work plans underway, we have working groups, and uh, we've already hit a number of milestones uh, towards these targets that we've set. It's been very quick progress, remarkable progress. I think one that demonstrates the leadership of North America in this space. We collaborate through a number of different mechanisms like the Trilateral Commission on Environmental Cooperation, the U.S.-Mexico Clean Energy and Climate Policy Task Force. We have technical experts working together on everything from forest management and forest monitoring to renewable energy, cleaner transportation systems, appliance standards. The engagement is literally day-to-day -day and it's deep and it's moving the space forward. So I'll just end by noting how much we really appreciate our collaboration with our neighbors to the north and our neighbors to the south. We've been really pleased to see North America emerge as a leader in addressing climate change in the space, and we're looking forward to a lot more collaboration in the years to come. Thanks. Thank you. We'd like to open this up for questions if people have them. In the meantime, let me kick one off for all of you. Please, please. Usually my voice carries, but we'll be glad to do that. Enrique, Dan, and Chris, you each talked about what Mexico and Canada and the United States are doing. You also described the commitment to collaboration and partnerships. Can you give some examples of where Mexico and the United States, or Canada and Mexico and the United States, will be actually doing a collaborative initiative together that helps all three nations achieve our goals? And then Sarah will go over to your question. Uh, I guess I'll go first. I, I think one area where we're, we're collaborating, I'll, I'll identify two, but one, um, I'll talk about methane. Methane is an interesting area because it's an important uh, climate pollutant. It's an area where we've identified where we know we need to take action. Uh, the North American leader statement identified that uh, we need to do a 40 to 45% reduction in methane by 2025. Um, and all three of us have active uh, sectors um, in oil and gas and what have you. Um, but it's also an area where we've identified that from um, Administrator McCarthy, Secretary Pacquiano, and uh, Minister McKenna, that they need to take action. And so we're working at uh, uh, technical exchanges through the Commission for Environmental Cooperation, where we can exchange best practices, learn the best ways of moving, and bringing together government and industry together to have that conversation so that we can um, learn from each other to reduce uh, methane emissions. So that's one practical, real, tangible example that will have big, real impact. It gets very technical very quick, so it requires the experts to get together um, and, and really talk it through, and it requires industry to, to, to participate in support. Um, so that's one. Yes, I, I guess I have a, a point to, to, to start talking about this. That when you when you look at the analysis, the declaration, uh, I mean, it looks uh, set of targets and simple, but as Chris was saying, the, the work of agreeing on those, target, on those targets was, was pretty complicated. It involved the collaboration and discussions, not only among environment uh, authorities like Dan and myself representing, but we had to have their 
energy, economic, finance, and, and some others. So we're, this is a joint work that we're, you know, like, uh, first of all, agreeing upon. But then implementation is also going to take that collaborative work. So right now, for instance, in the methane uh, that, uh, that Dan mentioned, or energy uh, department is, is, is looking at ways to, you know, learn from the experience of Canada and the U.S. on methane regulations to see if those are feasible and implementable in Mexico. In Mexico the way they, they, uh, they, they have uh, measured, the way they work with the industry, and this is, uh, in some cases, is, is new to us. Another area, and this is, this is being undertaken within our, our ministry, the Ministry of Environment, is, is the way, to, the way uh, both the U.S. and Canada have, have set standards for vehicles both vehicle emissions and energy energy efficiency of vehicles. So we have set up uh, task forces from, uh, from different ministries, the US EPA, Vermont Canada, and some other polls, and are looking also at ways since we, we share economic, a lot of economic and trade activity. Uh, trucks and cars go from Mexico to the US every, every day, a lot of them. So we need to harmonize the standards, the way we set the standards for emissions, the way we set the standards for energy efficiency. And that this is, this is a very good example. And it takes work from government, it takes work from industry, it takes work also from, uh, from research institutions. Chris, any comments you'd like to add on this? And then we'll go to the gentleman. No, I agree with, with both of those. And there's a number of other areas that we could mention, social cost of carbon clean energy investments, applied to standards. But I think I might actually highlight the work that we're doing on our longer term low emissions economic strategies, uh, what we in the US are calling our mid-century strategy. This was something that was called for under the Paris Agreement. Countries were encouraged to come forward with these longer term strategies for how to reduce emissions while growing. And this is something that uh, Mexico and Canada and the United States committed to working on together and to each uh, submitting before the end of this year. And so we've had pretty intensive work together as we share our approaches, as we talk about our strategies, as we have shared methodologies and tools. I think for the United States, it's been enormously valuable, not only because we will need to work together and the approaches in one country will very much affect the options in another, uh, but because we are integrated, because we share so many systems, we also can benefit from the advancements from the integration of those systems. So we've benefited on the technical side from sharing analyses, from sharing um, our uh, approaches, but we've really benefited from thinking together what our opportunities are in the long term and uh, being able to collaborate as we look forward to the second half of this century and how we really engage in deep decarbonization across the continent. Thank you. Sir, you have a question. Uh, it's a question and a uh, little explanation. Uh, I was an organizer for Earth Day here in Chicago in 1970. We got uh, Old Man Daly to appear, and we had the Attorney General, uh, Bill Scott, who was a Republican, to appear and gave speeches. There was also a little theater, coffins and everything. But um, just around the corner over here, you had at Rockefeller Chapel, you had a program on the sixth extinction. And there was a lot of young people there, probably over a thousand. And is it too late? Are we dealing with these issues too late? I, I, had, I had got my graduate degree here at University of Chicago a long time ago. Um, but I've been involved in this issue for a long time. I came out of the Selma March, anti-Vietnam War thing. I am a veteran of Vietnam. And then into the environmental thing because they shot people at Kent State. You have a sociopath on the Republican ticket that would probably undo everything here. And I'm going to either go to Mexico or Canada, and I'll tell you ahead of time. The question is, the question is, is it too late? Question. Or default to doing nothing? What are the most important things that the three countries can do quickly 
that will have the biggest impact. Perhaps you can comment on that. <coughs> Yes, I mean, the, 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 the path, the, the blueprint has already been set. I mean, and, and the blueprint is telling us, take action right away. The three countries are showing leadership, and it was expressed by the, by, by the three speakers, so we need to continue doing that. And at the same time, the other very important thing is convincing the whole society that this is an important issue, engaging everyone, all economic agents, all countries. Every single one needs to take part in this. And we have, a, a, I guess, that's probably the greatest challenge. So I'd say it can't be too late, because I've got three young daughters, and I want them to inherit the world and make it a better place for them. So it can't be too late. So I would say, building off of Enrique's comment, is once we engage people, we need to put a price on carbon. Polluters need to pay. Chris? I'll just add, uh, it's exactly right that what we know is we have to take action now. Every time we delay, we increase the cost, we increase the challenge. But we don't have any choice. We have to address this. So the world has put itself now on a pathway where it has the opportunity to address climate change. You have commitments from almost every country on Earth to do so. Those commitments aren't yet sufficient. We know that the intended nationally determined contributions uh, reduce the potential temperature rise by about half. It's not nearly where we need to be. But we also set in place mechanisms to ratchet up the ambition of those commitments every five years. So what we need is everybody focused, first of all, on implementing what we've committed to doing. And second of all, on looking for every opportunity, every approach to increase our ambition and increase our effectiveness over time. We will need to do more. We will need to cooperate internally to do that. We'll need to collaborate with international partners to do that. But we put in place the framework which makes that possible, and that makes me hopeful. So the key words and the answers were doing nothing is not an option, and ambition move fast. Yes, ma'am. Um, I would like to, uh, I'm a member of the, an enrolled member of the Mackinac Band of Ojibwe Potawatomi and uh, Ottawa. In, whose territory is being impacted substantially by a company called Enbridge um, with its pipelines that are running through our waters, uh, Line 5, under uh, the Straits of Mackinac. I don't remember, was it Line 6 that contaminated uh, the Kalamazoo River in 2010? Um, as we speak, and a lot of people don't know this, uh, through the efforts of activists in Minnesota, Enbridge's Sandpiper project was uh, diverted, and uh, but in August, just about the time that our people set up camp in uh, Cannonball, North Dakota, to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline, Enbridge uh, invested, uh, I think it was $1.5 billion in, with, along with Marathon, uh, petroleum uh, to um, try to get through that way. Um, so there is a snake in the room that I think everyone is not talking about, and that snake is Enbridge. Um, and your question about Enbridge is? Uh, well, actually, my, well, my question is, uh, what are you doing to stop Enbridge? Because you talk about um, well, it's, it's not just Enbridge, it's also about the uh, indigenous peoples. And uh, on the American side, the one thing that you didn't address were the treaties. Um, for example, in North Dakota, the Treaty of uh, Fort Laramie in 1851. And um, our treaties, uh, which guarantee us, for example, the use of fractionary rights to uh, the use of the water right. bringing so together. Let me, let so me move you like, to a question. Okay. okay. Well, actually, the answer to the question is, in our view, that you have to stop make building the pipelines. And uh, my question is, why aren't you doing that? Because money, you know, you, you can't pay, you know, you say you want to pay for polluters, but you, you can't pay for the damage that's being done, and especially with Line 5, if that erupts 
under the Straits of Mackinac. We're going to have a tremendous oil spill, a massive oil spill in the greatest, uh, largest freshwater uh, body of water in the entire world. As some people know, I have a passing familiarity with it. Uh, Chris, Dan, Enrique, any comments? Uh, I'll take a shot at that, and I won't comment on any one specific case, but I will say that this is just another example of why in the long term we do think we need to shift to cleaner energy sources, more renewable energy sources. And that's been one of the emphases of the Obama administration. You, as I mentioned, we've done a lot of work to put in place solar energy, wind energy, to make that a cost-effective option for the American people. And I think as we shift uh, power generation into these sectors, as we shift the capacity and the storage ability, storage capacity into the, these non-polluting sources, you're going to see a host of benefits on climate change, but also on the broader uh, environmental issues and public health issues. So this is one area where we've made a huge amount of effort. There's been a lot of investment. There's been a lot of progress, but we need to do more. And I hope that that will have a, a positive impact across the board in the coming decades. I appreciate that, but I, my question is, what are you doing to stop Enbridge from doing this? Because right now, you know, when it's okay. on, it's on. Once that line is in, once those lines are in, the damage has already been done. So okay. you have me. to stop them. Excuse me. Dan, do you have a quick comment you'd Thank like? You. And then we're going to have sort of 30 second wrap ups from Chris, Enrique, and Dan, if you would like to comment on this one. So I'll comment, and uh, I won't talk about any specific particular products that are going on in Canada, but I'll identify a couple of initiatives that are going underway. When the uh, government was um, elected in just about a year ago in Canada, there was a renewed commitment made to uh, reconciliation and to um, advancing the relationship for a government-to-government -government relationship with Canada's Indigenous peoples. And this government is putting in place a number of key initiatives to try and work through that. They've identified a number of, um, um, of ways to that, including um, putting in place, uh, acting on the, um, the uh, recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, putting in place the, uh, the uh, Commission for Murder uh, and Missing Indigenous but Women. If I may stop, you're not addressing the issue of Enbridge's so, pipeline, which is the, the single most important so issue to I us. I can't talk about any specific case, but what I can say is in this context, Canada's also now reviewing its environmental assessment law and looking at ways that we can better manage the environmental assessments, recognizing the uh, rights of Indigenous peoples to a meaningful uh, consultation and engagement in that process. But when it comes to a specific project, I don't have uh, at this time the ability to be able to answer and weigh in on specific cases. All right, let's see if we can do sort of a lightning round to wrap this up, because there's a very good panel that's sort of waiting in the on-deck circle, all right? Chris, Enrique, Dan, sort of 30-second closing points you'd like to make. Chris, go for it. I won't keep you from the next panel. I think talking to them about what is cutting edge in this space and what's coming, uh, especially on the technical side, is critical. I'll just note again that I think progress in the last few years and in the last few weeks has been absolutely remarkable. We are in a place that few would have expected us to be. It's not as far along as we need to be. We know that. But there are committed teams here in the US, across all sectors, across all parts of the society. And there's an incredible movement globally working on these issues. So the challenges will remain. We have to do more. We have to be more ambitious. But I think we put ourselves on the pathway to do that. And I think we'll look forward to progress in the years to come. And I think a large part of that will be North American leadership in this space. So thanks for the invitation. So I'll conclude by saying that my mother taught me that uh, a pessimist was a misinformed optimist. So I am an optimist. I think the time is now to take action. I think we have an opportunity to take action. We have traveled an incredible distance in the past six months, eight months. Um, we have a framework uh, continentally under which we can work collaboratively with three countries. Canada is building a framework that can take action nationally that is uh, an inclusive and comprehensive approach. And I think we have a framework globally under which we can now act. So I think uh, there's very strong reason to be optimistic. I, first of all, I agree with both 
uh, comments, the Arabic comments by Chris, and, and that let me, let me just mention that uh, when Scott and the, the Canadian consulate and also Bernard invited me to help to, to come here, I hesitated a lot because now we're going through a lot of uh, a lot of work in Mexico organizing this, this meeting of uh, 10,000 people in, in 35 days. Uh, we're getting ready for the next COP of climate change. Uh, my, my boss, the Minister of is going to Colombia with the president to work for a bilateral meeting. And so I was this close to cancel. But there the were only, baseball the only, <laughs> No, no, the only, the only reason I did not cancel is because I not nobody paid a ticket. We paid the Mexican government paid our fair 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 ticket. But, but then I'm, I'm gonna tell you why. I'm gonna tell you why and I um, I'm gonna reiterate what I told you in my last comment. Governments are leading the work and they're leading the work because it's it's responsibility. Citizens elected us to have that responsibility and we're doing as much as we can. President Obama, President, President Peña, and Prime Minister Trudeau are very clear on the importance of this, and that's the reason you saw that picture, and this was the only declaration that they had at the, at the North American Leaders Summit, the political declaration. But what we're doing as governments, not only in North America, but as Chris mentioned, throughout the world, with almost 200 countries, is not enough. We're about halfway to the target that we should be designed. So we need to keep convincing people. We need to keep making people aware, companies aware, states, cities, that this is an important problem, and we all need your engagement on this. The reason I came here was because this is a school, and I see in, in students, in the youth, a potential to keep the optimism that I share with them, that we can reach that half of the, that, the, the rest of the port that we, that we as governments couldn't make. So we need innovation from you, we need, we, we need awareness from you, and we need to work with everyone we can in order to make this possible. So thank you, thank you very much. I'll, I'll come as many times as you invite me, and I was very happy to hear. Thank you to the panelists, to the council general, and thank you not for your, just your comments tonight, but for what you will be doing, okay? Uh, thank you all, and we'll move to the next panel. Okay. Okay, so we're going to begin, uh, begin our, second, uh, our second panel uh, discussion on implementing uh, solutions to mitigating climate change at, at the local level and focusing uh, right here in Chicago. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a distinguished panel and uh, distinguished moderator, uh, Rachel Bronson. Uh, Rachel is the executive director and publisher of the Bulletin, uh, at the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Uh, Rachel oversees the Bulletin's publishing programs, the management of the Doomsday Clock, and a growing set of activities around nuclear weapons, nuclear energy, climate change, and emerging technologies. Uh, joining uh, Rachel on stage here are first uh, Charlie Catlett. Uh, Charlie is a director of uh, the Urban Center for Computation and Data, a senior computer scientist at Argonne National Laboratories, and senior fellow at the Argonne University of Chicago Computation Institute. He's part of a team implementing the Array of Things, uh, an urban sensing project to collect real-time data on Chicago's environment, infrastructure, and activity for research and public use. Uh, next, uh, next to Charlie is Chris Wheat. Uh, Chris is the Chief Sustainability Officer and Senior Policy Advisor in the Office of the Mayor of the City of Chicago. Chris uh, coordinates policies, projects, and operations across the city's department and agencies to advance the mayor's sustainability agenda. And I understand that there is a connection with the University of Chicago's uh, school, uh, Booth School of Business, where you uh, earned your MBA. And uh, speaking of the University of Chicago, uh, Sumit Ray, uh, here uh, on my uh, left is, is the executive director 
of Energy Management and Strategic Initiatives here at the University of Chicago. And Seward oversees the development and implementation of the university's energy programs as well as its uh, facility sustainability efforts. So please join me in welcoming our panel this evening. And I turn it over to you. Thank you very much. So I was asked to kick it off, and we're going to move very quickly to our um, presenters today. The idea is to do short presentations to get the con set the table for a good conversation for us to have a short conversation and then turn it over uh, to engage everybody in the room. I thought just to frame it though, what, um, what I'd like to share with you is kind of my thoughts on this, and, and I'm sure you share many of them, which is we've just heard some very, very important remarks about how national policy can set the framework or create in some ways the framework for the environment in which we're all working. But in a sense, especially in the space in terms of innovation around energy innovation and climate innovation, the general consensus is that the innovation is coming from the bottom up, that in many ways uh, national policies are lagging behind what cities and others are doing, because we don't have a choice in this. We have to prepare our city for what we know is coming, and so the mayor has been very forward-looking, as his predecessors have been very forward-looking, and thinking about how to create a city that can maintain um, drastic changes in climate in terms of what we plant in the streets to how we house our citizens to how we prepare for an influx that's likely to come. So on the city, at the university, and the research level, the innovation is happening here as it is in many local uh, environments around the country and indeed the world. So I think this is actually the mo most important conversation we're going to have tonight and thank you for your wisdom and staying to hear what, uh, what our panelists have to say. So with that, I, I think what the order is, we're going to turn it over um, to hear about uh, from Chris what, the, what uh, the city is doing, and then we'll move on to new research at Argonne, and then what the university is doing. So, Chris. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. All right. I want to make sure y'all aren't asleep just yet. Uh, I know the closer, every minute that goes by, we get closer and closer. Uh, to, to my bedtime, so I'll try to keep my uh, comments uh, uh, relatively uh, brief. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some examples of what we're doing here in Chicago. Uh, and I'm sure there will be some, some questions around that, but just to, to set a little bit of context around the role um, of cities in this. So we know that two-thirds of the world's energy is used in cities. We know that 70% of the uh, emissions happening around the globe are in cities. We know that 70% of cities uh, around the globe are experiencing climate change. That looks very different depending on uh, where you are in the world. That's gonna look different in a place like Indonesia versus Northern Europe versus Chicago. What we know about Chicago is that the 1995 heat wave is going to happen again. Uh, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. We know that the 10 year, uh, the, the rain event and flood that used to happen every 10 years now happens every two or every three. And so uh, not only is there a desire and, and frankly a necessity uh, for the this, this city in uh, regards to both government operations and working with residents and businesses to reduce our carbon footprint, but we also have to adapt and deal with the reality that services still have to be provided and that while this discussion is going on at the federal level, and we've seen leadership from President Obama and his compatriots in Mexico and Canada, unlike we've seen in a long time, that basements are still getting flooded um, in, uh, in, in South Shore, uh, that we're still having issues in regards to what invasive species looks like uh, in, in Lake Michigan. And so the realities of climate change are here and now. So we have to not only do what's necessary in order to uh, mitigate the risk of climate change while also helping develop a 21st century economy, but we have to deal with the reality that climate change is here, uh, here today. And that climate is, uh, it's, it's about more than just a greenhouse gas emissions number. We all want to reduce that. Um, but there are also significant benefits in regards to, uh, in regards to quality of life. So uh, improving climate is also about uh, creating more, uh, more uh, modern and safe places for children to play. It's about investing in city infrastructure so that we reduce the risk of things like uh, flooding. It's making sure that 
we are involving uh, community groups like Blacks and Green, like Faith in Place, into our decision making uh, process. And it's also making sure that we're thinking about concepts of equity and that, uh, that the benefits uh, and ownership of sustainability has to happen in all parts uh, of, of Chicago. And so um, I'll, oops, whoops. Can I go back? There you go. Um, so I'll talk about uh, some examples of, of a variety of projects that are happening uh, here uh, in Chicago. I also want to say that I was actually recently in uh, Toronto uh, with a lot of my uh, counterparts, urban sustainability directors from around uh, the country uh, and, uh, and also in Canada. I uh, saw some really amazing work in Toronto in terms of the, the waterfront and what they're doing not only in terms of improving bike access, but also creating economic development. Talk to our counterparts in Vancouver. They're really pushing the envelope uh, for, for zero carbon uh, buildings. And we're also uh, looking forward, many uh, cities are actually uh, gathering in Mexico City uh, in December for the C40 Cities Climate uh, Leadership Initiative. So in terms of how we think about, uh, how Mira thinks about how I think about um, the, the world of sustainability, it really falls into a few buckets. So one of them is around how do we strengthen Chicago uh, neighborhoods? And this really gets to issues of quality of life. So when we talk about the Chicago Plays program, where you have 300 refurbished playgrounds around the city, that really gets into the ability for all Chicago residents to be able to live, uh, work, and play. And that also gets to things like uh, the closure of the Fisk and Crawford plants, which are not too far from here. Work that was really led by community organizations for decades, uh, pushing uh, hard to ensure that uh, they had healthy air and that their uh, children had the ability to, uh, to live in a place that was, uh, that was coal free. There's also infrastructure. Infrastructure is critically important in a lot of this work. So this gets to things like uh, mode share and making sure that we have areas, uh, uh, things like uh, bike lanes. So we have 300 protective bike lanes, or nearly 300, like 299 or something, uh, bike lanes uh, around the city, which is one of the reasons that Bicycling Magazine uh, named Chicago uh, one of those bike, uh, bike friendly cities or the most bike friendly uh, city in the United States. We also see infrastructure investments in programs like Space to Grow. That's a really interesting program, which is a partnership between the city, uh, the city's water department, uh, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, the folks who run the sewer uh, system, and Open Lands, which is a um, community organization that is uh, focused on providing healthy and, and open spaces around the uh, around Chicago, around the Chicago land region, where all these organizations put dollars in to refurbish playgrounds. And these playgrounds not only are in low and moderate income parts of the city, but they're also in areas where we see flooding. So there's, a, there's huge benefits there, right? So we get a new playground in a school that desperately needs it. And we also reduce the risk of flooding in neighborhoods as well. And so that double and triple bottom line that's associated with a lot of the sustainability work we think has to be there and can be there in regards to, uh, in regards to infrastructure. In terms of engaging all of Chicago, we, push hard in terms of how do we engage uh, students and engage young people. So part of the One Summer Chicago initiative where over 30,000 uh, kids around Chicago have summer jobs, 2,000 uh, of them are actually involved in a program called Green Corps. Green Corps has actually been around for a long time uh, as a, a program for hard to, uh, hard to train or hard to employ individuals, but that program is now expanded to uh, high school youth, learning about horticulture, learning uh, about how to build, uh, build a bicycle, uh, and other efforts around uh, sustain sustainability. Engagement also means providing ownership in communities. And so one of the programs that, uh, that I don't touch directly, but I think directly falls uh, into the area of sustainability is a large lots program, where we're allowing individuals and neighborhoods to purchase city-owned vacant lots for $1 if they live on that street or if there's a community organization. And we try to not put a lot of parameters on exactly what you do with that because we want to give you the freedom to figure that out. As long as you mow the grass and put a fence around it, it's yours. And so what we've seen is a lot of innovation of individuals uh, creating their own play lots in terms of just creating uh, open spaces and meeting spaces for people in their neighborhood uh, to, to congregate uh, over time. And we also see that with Divi. Divi has really seen a dramatic expansion uh, over to the south and west sides. We've seen 85 new stations this year. We're covering roughly uh, two thirds of the city, including several uh, stops uh, not too far from here. 
There's also an element of, of connecting uh, residents and connecting all Chicago residents uh, to nature. We see that in uh, the city and the mayor's plan uh, called Building on Burnham, where the mayor has called for a dramatic increase in the amount of natural acreage uh, around the city. Right now we're at roughly 1,400 acres. He's called for the city to be at 2,020 acres uh, by 2020. You also see that in the Great Rivers Plan, which is talking about revitalization of the river, and not just things like the river walk, which are, which are great, but all aspects of the river, not just the north branch of it, but also the south and west sides, also Bubbly Creek, and we've been working with organizations like Oveo to, uh, to, to clean up the smell uh, in, in, in those areas, and really make this uh, an area that everyone, uh, everyone wants, to, wants to connect with. And last but not least, think, think about partnerships. Partnerships mean a lot of things. Partnerships mean uh, partnering with community organizations like Elevate Energy and the Historic Chicago uh, Bungalow uh, Association to increase retrofits. Partnerships means partnerships with folks like utilities, ComEd, uh, and Exelon. So we've done things like create one-stop shops, one-stop shops for single-family homeowners and landlords who are looking to do retrofits of their building. So instead of calling 15 numbers, there's one number, there's one website, and you get all the different incentives and programs that are available to you. Since we've established that, we've seen 22,000 retrofits happen in Chicago over uh, the last uh, the last three or four uh, three or four years. We're also seeing that in terms of energy efficiency, where uh, we are challenging large buildings around the sh around Chicago, from Navy Pier and the Wrigley Tower to the library down the street and IIT and Salvation Army to reduce their energy use by 20% over five years. And then we're working with them, with engineers, uh, engineers and others to, to, to really uh, help those buildings figure out exactly what that looks like. And then Charlie, I think, will really talk about uh, unlocking the potential of data, which I think we've just started with, with our benchmarking transparency, benchmark transparency ordinance, but we know that there's a lot to do. So we think there's a lot of good stuff going on uh, in Chicago. We know that we have to do more. We know that we have to think about uh, these initiatives in the context of, of equity and community and how we're bringing uh, all individuals around uh, Chicago uh, to the table. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here and look forward to the discussion. Staying so late. I thought look at the weather and the ball game going on. I don't see anybody. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, what we are doing at the University of Chicago. Uh, so I am from the University of Chicago, uh, the Facility Services uh, Department, and we have the Office of Sustainability in our department as well. <clears throat> so I'm very excited to talk about the strategic uh, sustainability plan. This is the first time we are doing it here and how we are doing it. So give me a little bit uh, update on that. So if you look at the University of Chicago, sustainability has always been a consideration here. Look at, we found this in 1926. The president, uh, Max Mason, said he sent a letter out to the faculty and staff and students to conserve or to waste, uh, reduce the waste energy and uh, by switching off lights and uh, and the thermostat, for the thermostat. And guess what? We still are doing the same thing today. <laughs> this is the University of Chicago way. Uh, moving forward, so uh, the University of Chicago here, the Office of Sustainability, started in 2008. And it has integrated part of the facility services. And if you can see there, and it has support from the engineering, from the project management, from um, um, funding, finance, and everything, so we have worked together. Uh, to get it work here in on our campus. And we focus on two things. First, to reduce the, the uh, resource, the resources we're using, how to reduce that, and how to engage the com com community, the campus, to, to, that, uh, to that extent. So in that, uh, in that way, the Office of Sustainability does the outreach program as well. We are working in the Purpose Initiative, as you can see, the outside our uh, department also and uh, we get involved in the daily interaction with the 
generally the queries, and also we work with the peer institution, the peer organization like uh, ID Plus, the Sustainability Cons Consortium we have, and the Chicago Land Network of Sustainability. That's coming up now. Now, this is the, our strategic uh, sustainability plan in the baseline report. <clears throat> So there are nine areas, as you see on the right hand side, there's a nine areas we are focusing on from the uh, sustainability standpoint. Uh, and now we are reporting on two things. One is how we are making progress uh, on an annual basis on each one, one of these areas, and also greenhouse gases, gas emissions, the, the GHG emissions. These two items we are working on for a while, a couple of years now, simultaneously, and this is the first time we are putting together the baseline report. We are combining these two, and this is coming on from 2009 to 2015, uh, all the data, and they're putting together, and this will be the first time we're going to publish that in our website next month, actually, in autumn 2016. So you are getting a sneak preview, which nobody has seen this before. So that's what we did. So this is the executive summary. As you can see, we are very data-driven and uh, goal-oriented. So here you can see the, all the nine areas we talked about, and they have the highlights of each one of them. And like for example, you can see here uh, the uh, uh, you can see the the recycling stuff. We are diverging like 41 percent on the average. But our peer institution, for example, they are in 50 plus. So then you can see the room for improvement. So we are setting our target to improve our diversion rate from the landfill as well. Now in this year, uh, fiscal year 17, we are focusing on those six areas uh, out of uh, all nine. And we are doing this in a very strategic way and find out okay, why we have to do this and what are the things we can do to make it better. So for example, the first one you can see the, uh, uh, the climate uh, change. Uh, climate change and energy, that's an uh, energy management plan we'll talk about a little later. High performance building, then another one you're going to work on. The waste reduction, that's our target rate is from 41 like we talked about and moving to 45 percent. Uh, water conservation, we're going to try to decrease that by 5 percent. That's a goal we are setting for 2017. And multimodal transportation, the other one we are working on very closely with multi-departmental uh, effort. And building awareness to a partnership also, what may the provost and the staff and the students. So this is the first one, climate uh, change and energy. So University of Chicago, we set up a goal. We want to reduce 20% our emission by 2025. And then you can see there uh, that we did a baseline before we do you know, the seven star we you know when we are at. So we did a baseline and you can see here we are at 25. 0.5. And the baseline target they set up on last three years, 2012 to 2014, average of those three, uh, three years. That's how we set up our baseline. And from there, you can see uh, in the last year, 2015, we went down 1%. And that 1% reduction mainly came from the electricity usage, reduction in electricity usage in our building. So we did some energy projects on our campus. Now, if you see on the right hand side how, where this is coming from, you can see almost 70% of the GHG greenhouse gases coming from the, the electricity or gas usage. And everything else is 30-30%, like your commuting and you know everything else. So that's why we're focusing on the energy. Energy is a big thing, energy efficiency, as everybody knows. That's what makes a big chunk of the GHG gases. Now talking about the energy plan, so we are have a very robust plan for this year and moving forward for our campus. We have a five-prone approach, the different ways to do this energy uh, efficiency. We have to do all at the same time or simultaneously because we have different type of buildings, different energy intensity of those buildings, different usage of those buildings. So some of the buildings you can see, uh, the multi-building approach, those, those are the projects we're going to do all the campus-wide at the same time. And then the top 30 building, there's a different category for that. Top 30 means those 30 buildings, they use 80% of our energy. So that's where the focus is for. And they have a different in-depth analysis you have to do, and there's a lot of opportunity for them. And then we have bottom 60 buildings. Those are the smaller size of buildings, but they use small energy, but a lot of them. 
and there are the things we can do to increase the efficiency as well. Those are the older buildings. As you can see in our campus, we have brand new buildings and 100 year old buildings. Also. So we have a combination of all kinds of types of buildings. Then we are also focusing on the energy project. Those are the one of you know, lighting projects or any other projects on different buildings coming up. The, the last one, but not the least, is the central utility plant. So we have two central utility plants, South and the West Cup. And this produces the steam and chill water and compressed air and goes throughout the campus. So if we do anything there, if we reduce energy or they make it more optimized or they're energy efficient, that has an impact on all over the campus. So that's why we're focusing on those as well. Okay, now moving forward. So part of the energy efficiency is the LEED building. And everybody knows, talk about it, right? So we have decided in our campus, uh, any project we do more than $5 million, we go for LEED. So LEED certification. If it is less than $5 million, we still follow the LEED guidelines, but we may not go for the certification itself. But we follow our standards always LEED or better. So from 2009, we already have nine buildings certified, as you can see there. And we are in the process of doing another five buildings. So next is the uh, multimodal. Uh, transportation. So we are. This is we are not a leading on this uh, initiative, but we are working with the transportation department and other departments at the post office to make it better. So how to reduce our carbon footprint? So which is not a big number. The uh, transportation is only six percent of our GHG emission. So we are working with the par uh, parking structure, our parking and planning department, and uh, also the civic engagement to reduce this. Now the next one is the West. The West is a big one. And this is not a GAG standpoint, it's only 4% of our emission, but this is a big impact on our campus. And as you can, as you can see, there's a lot of things we can do on the, uh, on the West and the cycle side. And we are uh, focusing on uh, this year, there's more recycling. We are target is increasing from 41 to 45%. Also eco-digester, what we do in our dining hall for the food. Uh, and the composting of the landscape and also the food, food thing outside. Now the other one we are focusing on is the water conservation. So water, this is we haven't done much on campus and as you can tell the water is a scarce commodity and the price is going up every year. Uh, so we have set up a uh, target this year to reduce our water usage by 5%. So we are in process of collecting all the data and do the baseline. How much <coughs> and they come up with a profile when they're using or spending on water. Uh, so also now moving forward in our design, we are building this thing in water efficient design. For example, in our quad, like one third of the quad is hardscape. So we have to design such a way that we use less water to begin with. Then we decide how to minimize the water usage, the rest of it. Uh, for example, you see that uh, our north quad, uh, in that north quad we have 120,000 gallons underwater tank, which collects the rainwater, the rainwater harvesting, and then we use that. And this is a smart system in the sense it, it, if it forecasts there is a rain there, it dispenses the water and make it a, enough room to the new rainwater to get in. So we are using that as well. So this is helping us a lot. And we also have smart uh, irrigation system, and it checks and works that way as well. So the last one, the engagement, how we are working together. You can see here uh, that we are working with the student, the faculty, and the, uh, uh, and, the, uh, and the campus side together. So these are a few examples that we started from the provost and the initiative uh, is called Campus as a Lab. Meaning we are taking the data from the campus, the real data, and the student, uh, they are using that data, come up with the research, doing the research and come up with the action plan, how to use that data to solve real life problems. Uh, so we are giving the data like our energy usage or water usage or gas usage and they're saying okay how we can forecast how much you can use and how we can reduce it. So this is going on and we had the first one, it's very, very successful and we are planning to do more of that. And also uh, we are planning to do a West Zero West uh, athletic event next year. Uh, so we're going to take one event and <coughs> see how hard they are around that time and see how we can make it better, make it zero. Uh, and all the students and volunteers will be involved in doing it. 
So those are the things we are doing uh, internally or on campus here. So I'm uh, very excited about that. I think we have a lot of opportunity and we are working together. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm going to talk about a partnership between the city, the university, and Argonne National Laboratory. And this microphone is not going to cooperate. Um, it's called the Array of Things, which is a bit of a play on words of Internet of Things and the notion of an array telescope. And the idea is to work with the city, work with the community areas in Chicago, neighborhoods and residents, <laughs> to give a level of measurement to the city that's really necessary to solve, diagnose and solve some of the challenges that Chris and Suman have talked about um, locally, as well as to give the city, um, to, to provide a model for other cities uh, to be able to measure things related to not just local issues, but uh, global issues. So let me start with some of the work that kind of um, motivated this project and that was going back about five years I started working with the city of Chicago with the um, various people in the mayor's office the chief data officer chief information officer and we were trying to help connect open data with social scientists and economists and other uh, policy makers and planners uh, who had the questions that they needed to answer about cities but didn't necessarily have the expertise to go out and find data and bring it together. What we found was that the technology people um, in the city that like to do maps and visualization and, and software, um, they were all over the open data doing all sorts of apps, but they, they would say, well, we know how to analyze sort of the data, but we don't really know the right questions to ask. So we tried to bring the people with the questions together with the people that could uh, analyze the data. Now one thing that you see about these maps up here, and I'll just quickly tell you what these are, um, just going from left to right at the top, um, on the left is um, life expectancy in Chicago, with dark red being the shortest and uh, light yellow being the longest, and a difference of about 14 years. So depending on where you, where you live in the city, your life expectancy can have a difference of 14 years. Just below that is Philadelphia, where the where the range is 20 years. So you can move a mile or two in one direction or another in Philadelphia, and all of a sudden, your lifespan increases by 20 years on, on average. Then moving over to the right, the, the colorful green and red there is asthma rates in Chicago, where red is high and green is low. And then below that, uh, asthma hospitalizations for youth in Boston, where blue is high and, and yellow is low. And then just moving over uh, at the bottom, you see a map of the city of Chicago uh, where there are dark gray areas and green areas. That's the time that it takes to get from a particular part of the city into the loop, into the city center. In the green areas, you can use public transportation to get downtown in less than 30 minutes. In the gray areas, it's 90 minutes or longer. So what you see across all these maps, and I'll come to the question marks in a moment, is that where you live in the city affects your ability to live, work, and play. And most of the data that we have about the city, we have administrative data, we have crime data, we have inspection data, that's all the way down to the street level. We, we can have a timestamp and a ge geolocated crime, and that's published data for the last 15 years in Chicago. But when it comes to things that are related to health, like air quality or weather, which is in fact in the middle there, right under the, the, the uh, right in the middle at the top, the other green, the lighter green and, and red is a one hour forecast of crime probability based on crime, or for which we have data that's right down to the street level, and weather for which we only have a few weather stations around the city. In the far right hand side, you see the places where the EPA has air quality sensors in the city of Chicago and the places where they don't. Huge parts of the city where we have no real scientifically useful data about air quality. So as we started trying to work with the city and with scientists to study some of these challenges of cities, 
we quickly found that there was a lot of missing data. So we asked ourselves, is it possible that we could take new technology like Internet of Things and actually blanket the city with a measurement system that would give us that data? And not just the do-it-yourself at home, um, you know, qualitative data, but scientifically accurate, uh, precise data about <coughs> concentrations of carbon monoxide or particulate matter from one micron up to 100. The reason we were able to do this, in fact, I brought, I brought, I always like show and tell in school. I brought uh, one of our devices and I'll explain it in a moment. The reason we were able to do that is if you think, look at the, the diagram I just showed you, I'll just go back to it on the right. Why is it that the EPA, I won't go back, I guess. Why is it that the EPA doesn't have a thousand sensors in Chicago that give us air quality? The reason is those stations cost millions of dollars. Those instruments cost fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, or maybe a thousand dollars for the cheap ones. Now, with new technology, we're we're able to shrink those stations down to something this size. And what you're looking at here costs us about fifteen hundred dollars to build. Now, at that price point and at this size, and these are strapped as you can see on poles, that. One right there is the corner of Washington and State, by the way, on the southeast corner. Um, so you can see it's a fairly small uh, device. And what we were able to do was do the development, the research development on this device, which I'll explain in a moment what it does, with Argonne and New Chicago investment, local investment. And then we went to the National Science Foundation in partnership with the city, and, and we said, hey, we want to put 500 of these across the city of Chicago because we have this group of scientists that we started three years ago having workshops with atmospheric scientists and transportation scientists and social scientists. We have this cadre of scientists from 30 universities who are saying they really want to measure the city and they have specific things they want to measure. So the National Science Foundation gave us, the university, a $3.1 million grant so that we could put 500 of these up in Chicago. Part of that was to take a platform we developed at Argonne and package it like you see here so that it's it's partly it's uh, not ugly. I, I, I think it's pretty, but it's my baby. But it's not ugly, but it's also strategically designed so that once the wiring is done, this is plugged in with a yellow wire you can see looped below the one on the pole. Once that wiring is done, it's about two hours of work by Department of Transportation electricians replacing this with a new version two years from now with new sensors and more powerful devices inside should take about as much labor and cost as it would take to put up holiday decorations. You go out the bucket truck, you cut two stainless steel straps, unplug the old one, plug the new one in and put two, two straps around. So what we've done then with this project and what, well, I should say what we will have done when we're finished is wire up the city of Chicago like no other city is wired up for doing research and measuring. Okay, so what are we measuring? I don't know if I have a slide on what we're measuring. Let me, uh, let me go back. So what we're measuring are three different types of things. Uh, I'll just say in this white thing here, this is called a Stevenson shield. Stevenson shield is a, it's a, it's a stack of upside down bowls with holes inside, so there's a cavity inside this here. It lets air in, it lets ambient light in, but it doesn't let direct precipitation or sunlight hit the electronics. So hanging inside this cavity are environmental sensors, things like temperature, humidity, barometric pressure, uh, vibration, magnetic field, uh, air quality sensors, seven different gases, carbon monoxide, ozone, nitrogen dioxide, etc. And then in most of the devices, mostly it's a cost issue, we also do particulate matter, particles. And you've heard of PM 2.5, 2.5 micron particles, PM10, those are the ones that are typically measured. Um, we can go from one micron all the way up to 100. So we not only get the fine particles that are really dangerous that go straight into your bloodstream, but also we get pollen. So we can, uh, we can collect that data as well. The third thing that this does um, is give us data about the general conditions and activities around where this is mounted. In the top of this, is a five megapixel camera that's pointed straight up at the sky, along with infrared and ultraviolet sensors. So this is useful for our climate and, and weather uh, scientists. Now, and this is the controversial part, in the bottom, 
pointed from 20 feet up down at the street is a five megapixel camera. And I kind of resisted the idea of a camera in this because I knew that it would make the discussion with residents much more tense, if you will, as people are concerned about privacy. You'll notice, by the way, in that picture up there, our device is mounted above one of the tens of thousands of surveillance cameras in the city, so you're already uh, being, being watched by cameras. But we wanted to do something different with this device. And we were able to do something different because inside this device are powerful computers that we can remotely program. And what that means is that we can take images from this camera, and what we'll do is take roughly two images per second. And we'll keep about 10 minutes worth of images and make those images available to software that runs inside the box. And that software is programmed at any given time to extract specific information from the, from the pictures. The number of pedestrians, number of bikes, buses, trucks, cars, and only that. And then after that 10 minutes is over, we delete the images. So what we've done with this technology is firewalled all the privacy issues into the box so that, if you will, no private information escapes from this box. Now, the camera on the bottom there, I don't know what the privacy policy is for that camera. I don't even know who operates it. But I'll tell you that our cameras have a privacy policy that's out on the web that was developed through a public process that started back in January and included online and in-person meetings. And there's a governance policy along with that that, that calls for accountability from an independent group on the outside. So we thought this is an opportunity for the academic community to work together with the city and with our National Laboratory to do science using cameras, but in a way that is ethical uh, and that respects privacy. And that's the only way, I would say, that we can do a partnership with residents that will really work. Because the idea behind these devices is a partnership with the people in the city of Chicago. All of the data from these is immediately published for free and open. So you'll be able to get the data on the city of Chicago's open data website. You'll be able to get it on a variety of portals. Microsoft is one of our partners. They're doing an education portal for high school students and faculty. You'll be able to look at things like on the right-hand side, the, uh, the first nodes are going up, and among other places, the Pilsen and McKinley Park area to look at. And that's a partnership, by the way, between us at the University of Chicago, the city, Presence Health, and the Instituto del Progreso Latino to look at air quality and make that data available to students in that high school who are interested in the health effects of, of air quality. And we also are straddling the Stevenson Expressway so we can look at how transportation affects air quality as well. The way the data is made available is also enabling people to write applications. And there are a, ne a number of groups that have approached us and said, we want to write an application. So imagine that you're a single parent, or maybe not a single parent, and you have a kid that has asthma. You want to get an alert in the morning that says, hey, the node near you is showing really high rates of asthma. So maybe you want to drive your child to school rather than have them walk today. So we're trying to look at different ways to make this data accessible to every different type of person that lives and works and plays in Chicago. Each of the deployments, you see several of them here. Each of the deployments, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but I'll try to hurry. Um, each of the deployments, uh, we intend to be a partnership with uh, residents, and I actually have this one, with residents, something they're concerned about, with a scientific community that is willing and already funded and already working in that area and says, hey, if you give us better data, we can give some insight into that challenge. And then the third necessary ingredient is someone, an agency head, a department head, a uh, department director, a uh, commissioner in the city that says, I want insight too because I have some ideas on how I can improve that particular uh, uh, concern of those, those residents. So you see the McKinley Park area, the stars in the bottom left, that's about air quality. Up and down the lakefront, as well as east to west on Randolph, this is just the first 40 locations and they should be up by mid-December. Um, that T-shape that includes the lakefront is to look at the lake effect on weather and air quality. And then the zoom in on the loop is a, another T-shaped configuration, if you will, where we wanna look at um, the movement of pedestrians and vehicles 
and our capability to use, what we're doing is using artificial intelligence in these to analyze the images. So we're starting with that right there. If you look at a map of Chicago with even 100 locations, it looks pretty dense in terms of deployment, but we have a budget for 500. So we're really excited about the next two years of rollout. We'll do 100 of them by March or so, then we'll take a break and do a redesign and add some new sensors. By this time next year, we'll add another 200, and roughly a year later, we'll add another 200. Now, something that caught us by surprise was the level of interest in doing this in other cities. This is just in the last 10 months, 60 cities at two per week these days have come to us and said, we want to do a pilot project. So the red ones on here are ones where we're going to try to get these devices, several of them, in 2 to 20, depending on the city, by January or February. And what that means is that we can take what we're doing in Chicago and export that to other cities. And as we start to populate, this is only 60 cities, but imagine that we have uh, you know, 1,000 cities or even 500 cities. This becomes, we've, we've called it a fitness tracker for the city. It actually becomes a fitness tracker for the planet. Um, because the way this works is, since all the data is open, it all comes together in one database here in Chicago, even from those other cities. All that data will come together in one place. Now, they'll mirror it and they'll do things with it locally, but it means that climate scientists can start to look at data that's measured in a consistent way across the planet, across different cultures and climates and urban forms and densities and sizes. So we're really excited about taking this local project and then uh, pushing it out. And I'll, I'll end my however long that was uh, here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good, thank you. Um, if we're really quick, I can sneak in two questions, but probably only have time for one. So uh, we have students here in, in the audience who are who care a lot about um, the climate, sustainability, and are working on different issues. I was curious, um, what innovations are you all looking at that you're excited about that you can incorporate back into your work? And um, Charlie, I was thinking in some ways you are the innovation that others would answer, but you must be looking out and saying, you know, here also is what's coming that I'm excited about, and, and then uh, to our other panelists. Well, I, I can start. You know, this is a platform that's open, and so some of the interest on this map is computer science um, people who say, well, we want to write the software. I, I didn't mention it, but one of the first things we're doing is looking for standing water. And we want to place these in parts of the city where there are urban flooding problems. And it may be as simple as we report the standing water and somebody goes out and notices that they just need to move the leaves out of the, out of the storm drain. Um, but we're looking for communities of people that are interested in machine learning, artificial intelligence, computer vision, because when this is fully deployed, that's a thousand cameras, half of them pointed up at the sky and half of them pointed at the street surface. That's a particular interest to social scientists. And then the data itself, uh, you know, it'll be available uh, and always open and always free for people to look at. Um, and we'll put it in the portals so that you can do the kind of study that we did, which is crime and weather, but have detailed data about both. So I, I would say two things. One, we don't know what the next innovation is, which is why the, the open data that Charlie and others are putting together uh, is, is so critical. And a lot of that work has been led by Brenda Bourbon, the, the city's chief uh, information officer, and Tom Shank, the city's chief data officer. I, I know it will sh shock you, but the government doesn't know everything. Um, and I think that particularly as the problems that we deal with are getting more and more complex, and we're in a time of austerity where we're not necessarily hiring, I don't have a budget for a climate scientist. Uh, so we are going to have to look out to- I have a couple you can borrow. Sure, we'll take them. Um, so we're gonna have to look out to folks like you all um, for, for solutions, not only from a data-driven and quantitative standpoint, but in terms of what uh, those solutions look like uh, when we implement them at the, at the ground level, which is why involvement in community organizations and, uh, every, and Chicago residents is so critical. I would say in terms of specific subject area, uh, one area that we're starting to spend a lot of time on is around urban agriculture. 
So there are a lot of benefits to urban agriculture, right? It's another leg of economic development. It's a reuse of vacant land to, for us to think about vacant land as an asset versus uh, a liability. As, as you articulated, the University of Chicago's commitment around uh, local produce and local food, and that's something that's important to the city and, and important to a variety of, of actors as well. We just received a million dollar grant from the Department of Agriculture to look at a micro grant program that we're gonna run with nonprofit organizations. Uh, you're seeing more and more development along the Inglewood line, which is not too far from here, which is gonna be the next uh, 606. Uh, and a lot of that land is actually going to be repurposed uh, for, for, for urban agriculture. And you see groups like Growing Home, Growing Power, Windy City Harvest, really doing amazing things, particularly with young people. And, and so I have a significant interest. I know the mayor has significant interest, be it reducing food deserts, creating more uh, 21st century jobs, and, and really uh, creating an urban agriculture ecosystem in Chicago. So for us, the similar thing, we are always looking for new technology, new innovation, uh, how to use that in our campus, how to make it more efficient. So for example, if you look at what it, we used to use like T12 labs, right? Then they come to uh, fluorescent, compact fluorescent, now LEDs. So those are the quantum jumps. So we are using the same amount of, or less energy, but producing the same amount of lights. So those are the things we are always interested in getting in and embrace that and try it out, pilot it out, and the local utility we're partnering with, uh, they have the incentive program we're getting involved. So that kind of stuff we're always interested. Same with the, uh, with our data, like we talked about, how the students, they get involved. They want to play with the data. They come up with, okay, what you have and what the problem we can solve, how we can make it better. They come up with the modeling. They are telling us, like, you know, if you get the weather data and the energy data, they can forecast how much you can how our campus is going to look like, how we need to buy our, or the gas, and when to buy, that kind of stuff. So we are always open to that, and we're always looking forward to new innovation to use it. And so the question, the first one was on technology. Let me um, tie back to the first panel and have my second question be on um, policy. So what was interesting to me about each of your presentations, it was almost policy-free in some ways, right? It was about kind of what, what we were doing on the ground technologically to try to address the challenges of, uh, of climate. But what I'm curious is, um, and because maybe we start with you, you know, at the city level, how important is some of the things that we heard in, in the first panel about COP21 and about these standards? Does it have any effect on what you're doing? And if so, how? And then, so when I might just ask you then, uh, on the city level, what city policies are out there that you think about that either can help what you're trying to do at the University of Chicago or not? And um, Charlie, to you, have you seen changes in policy or interest in what's going on affect your funding for the research that you've had? Or is, is there, are there certain things that have happened that have made these, this project easier to do? Or is it all just kind of noise out there, but the real innovation, is, it's independent of it? So maybe, uh, Chris, I'll start with you on that. So the impact of federal policy and what happens at the city level. So federal policy is tremendously important. Uh, I, I think COP21 has been a, a critical juncture in regards to the discussions uh, in or around climate. It also shifts the nature of the discussion that's happening in cities. So if you think about the Chicago Climate Action Plan, 2008, city establishes an emission, emissions goal. And one of the reasons that you know, the predecessor to my predecessor to my predecessor established that goal is because we were in the absence of a goal for federal government. And so we're in a slightly different scenario now. That scenario may or, you know, may, or may not look different on January 20, 2017. Um, but we were in a scenario now where, where the federal government is taking uh, leadership. I think the federal government's also uh, come to the realization, as I think many cities have, around the concept of resilience. And so you looked at folks like the Department of um, Housing and Urban Development that are uh, putting in dollars, they're requiring as part of, you know, uh, as part of investments, how are you thinking about flooding? How are you thinking about earthquakes? How are you thinking about soil erosion? So uh, the federal government still ultimately has the power of the purse. And, and, and they're ultimately dictating much of the, much of the policy that, that's trickling down to the cities. At the same time, there's a, there's a critical role not only in terms of programs, but in terms of policy, be it the city's, um, the city's benchmarking uh, ordinance that requires large buildings to, to benchmark and track 
their energy usage to requiring that any building that receives city assistance go through a fairly uh, stringent environmental protocol uh, from things like LEED certification, which I know UFC uh, does, to energy use, stormwater, um, community participation, et cetera. So I think that there is a tremendous role for federal policy. Ultimately, what that looks like on the ground, it's gonna take leadership from states, and in particular, it's gonna take leadership from cities. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that we spend, I, we spend a lot of our time on the phone with San Francisco and Vancouver and New York uh, and London and what other, or and even cities like Cincinnati and, and Cleveland. Uh, and so what other cities are trying, uh, what are they getting right and what are they getting wrong? So I think this is a big impact on our campus. So any other campus, I said, what their policy is. So I can give you a few examples, like he was talking about. So city is now adopting you know, new and new technologies, like you know, the building ID system in 2013. That means we have to put more stuff, more energy efficiency, uh, efficient systems in our buildings when you are building it. So that is helping us. And uh, like for example, I can tell you now, any building we do any renovation or the new building, we have to have the heat recovery system. So no HVAC system cannot go without heat recovery. That's a code, so we have to go with that. So those are the things helping us. Another thing, like he's talking about the uh, benchmarking ordinance, the Energy Star, it was not there before. So we didn't know how our buildings are doing, especially the smaller one. Now with this new ordinance, we have forced, kind of. We like it, but you know, we, we did it. Uh, but now we You're know the, <laughs> yes. Now we know the, uh, how our buildings are doing. We have a track of all the benchmarking for all our buildings, now, pretty much and those are in that category. So yeah, this is helping a lot. I think, you know, in our case, we're just starting out. And so, you know, just keeping with the fitness tracker analogy, it's like we're just putting it on right now. And so there's a near-term benefit to starting to do this measurement. And I think, you know, it was actually about a year ago, Bloomberg interviewed the mayor about the project, and I liked the way he was thinking about it, which was essentially, you know, if we have this information, we can start to look at trends and take action before they get to the point where somebody has a problem or starts to, you know, complain about it. And, and one way to look at that is that we're we're wanting to not rely solely on people to be sensors about noise or air quality, which is a, you know, people shouldn't be used to give us air quality data. Uh, we should be measuring it um, for them. And and so this a notion of a proactive policy versus reactive is something that. I think we'll be able to see in the short term. In the long term, you know, not just the number of steps I took today, but you know, over the last six months, how am I doing on sleep or, or exercise? You start to look at trends longer term that will help you with long-term plans and some of the actions that, you know, or policies that Chris would be looking at, um, such as if we understand how the lake affects air quality and weather, and then we project forward using computational models or other um, techniques to say, well, okay, if the climate does this or this or this, then how is the city going to do? What, what's the lake effect going to be? And that might cause some different policies about urban form or green spaces um, that we, we wouldn't think to do because we wouldn't have the longitudinal data that we hope to get out of this project. So it's late in the evening. We probably have time for one question, if anybody has. Yes, sir. Uh, this is for Chris. <clears throat> um, my name is Kenneth Newman. I'm a neighborhood resident. So almost 50 years ago, I was working at the first recycling center, six blocks from here at the Hyde Park Co-op. And I used to bash cans so the containers could break glass, so the containers could hold more. So uh, I've learned a lot about solid waste um, long story, and tipping fees and the cost of operating garbage trucks. And what is the city going to do, especially with CPS and the Park District, when it comes to collecting enormous amounts of recycling material that's mixed with garbage, and unfortunately right now there are billions of pounds not getting recycled all over the city. I think you're about 10% for the entire city right now? Right, our, our diversion rate, I think it's a little higher than the 10, but, but our, our diversion rate is behind lots of other cities. 
Uh, and so I don't, you know, look, I don't think anyone uh, at City Hall would start doing backflips uh, about, about recycling. Um, you know, we've had a, a long history around recycling. We've had lots of different policies around recycling. Um, you know, use a blue bag, don't use a blue bag. Now don't put any bags in. Um, you know, go to, go to this center, go to that center, or maybe you have one in, in your facility. So here's, here's where we are today. Uh, city controls uh, recycling for single family homes and two through four flats. Every, uh, every residential unit, four flats of below, has a uh, blue bin. That's different. And that's, that's, that's a definite positive, and that's, that's a preliminary step. That's the first step, but it's not as far as we need to go. What we do know is that even in the recycling that we're collecting, that the contamination rates that we're seeing are uh, very high. Uh, some of that is food waste, a lot of that is plastic bags, which is one of the reasons that as part of um, the 2011, or sorry, 2017 budget, the mayor is actually proposing uh, a tax on uh, plastic and paper bags. The reason for that is because it works to reduce the amount of bags that people take. If you look at Virginia and DC and Maryland, uh, there's an academic study done. 80, over 80% 80 of people who walked out uh, of a store before the tax took a bag. Once you put the tax in, it goes down to 44%. So one of the ways, and, and so when we, when I talk to our department's recent sanitation, the biggest problem is plastic bags getting caught in our facilities and in our MRFs for, our, for the cool kids here. Um, so I, I think that, and, and when it comes to waste for Park District and, and CPS, I think they know they have to do more recycling. I think one area that they've been really good at is composting. So CPS is actually doing it's doing seven pilot projects now where they're having the students uh, do composting. The Park District is actually running composting now at Soldier Field uh, for, for Bears games, and they're looking um, at a long-term plan where most large festivals uh, Lollapalooza, Riot Fest, et cetera, would actually have composting as part of, of, of what they're doing as well. So I think that, and, and we're actually uh, going to begin doing, and this is a shameless plug, uh, with the Chicago Sustainability Leaders Network, we're actually, there you go. So so you're gonna be at a variety of focus groups we're gonna do over the next couple months to solicit more community input on what we're doing on, on recycling. So I think there's a strong desire to do more. Uh, we need more community input and community feedback in order to see what that looks like. So we're at the end of our time, unfortunately. I don't know if, no, I, real quick. Mm -hmm. I, I want to get back to the last innings of the game, so. Just, but just real quick, because it's late. All right. Uh, in Pilsen, they had two plants, and we tried for 25 years to close these plants down. But the alderman, who was there for 25 years, he was had a very, very close campaign, probably within 30 or 40 votes. He won that campaign, he won a little chicanery like Chicago, but they closed the plants down afterwards. That's what has to be done. There has to be some action and some response. Okay, thank you. So um, from, from the consulate, I'm looking out, do you, any last words or should we, uh, Mr. Consul General? Well, I'll, uh, in the interest of time, uh, just to say thank you very much. Uh, please, uh, please join me in, uh, Round of applause for this. Thank you for the, uh, thank you for the excellent presentation, the very practical implementation of measures and, and uh, measuring techniques for uh, addressing, uh, addressing these important uh, environmental issues. Uh, outstanding presentation. Thank you again very much for being here. Thank you all uh, for your participation. Thank you again to the International House. Have a great evening. And go Cubs.